Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today where we'll be discussing collective uh, intelligence um, and how it can advance sustainable development and change the world. <laughs> Thank you all so much for joining. Um, you've already taken an intelligent step by logging on um, because we've got a really great speaker um, and a really great collaborator um, on, uh, on with us today. Um, Jeff Mulgan um, has worked in many, many facets of public life, in media, in government, both at national and municipal levels, with academic institu institutions. He co-chairs the World Economic Forum Group looking at innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, and he's also written a great book, which is mainly what we're going to be talking about today, among others he's written. But the one we're talking about today is called Big Mind, How Collective Intelligence Can Change Our World. Um, and, and I'm very proud to say as well that, that many of us within the UN have worked with uh, Jeff. Um, in fact, he has personally worked with UN country teams in Moldova and Lesotho, in addition to Nesta, uh, having worked with many other uh, UN agencies around the world. Um, so as the chief executive of Nesta, uh, Jeff Mulgan brought a team with him to Moldova and uh, Lesotho, um, Eddie Copeland, who's the director of government innovation, and Tom Sanders, who's a senior researcher, to actually prototype collective intelligence and what the UN can do um, working at the country level. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that, um, that the work both in uh, in Kishnau um, and in Mazero continues um, in Lesotho. They're working on, on an open accountability framework, um, which is bringing together data innovation, citizen engagement, and collective intelligence. And in Moldova, the UN country team is testing out applying a platform strategy to the work of the UN. Um, so so the, the engagement of Nesta, um, and Jeff personally has really made a difference there um, in its practical and insightful um, contributions. So we're really, really great to, really, really happy to, to have this conversation today. Let me just uh, quickly hand to Peter, who, do you want to make some announcements about technical things? And then we'll go from there. Uh, sure. Um, so we have about uh, 62 people online, uh, and we look forward to, to more joining uh, as we progress. Now we have 63. Um, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to put them in the question box uh, during the course of uh, Jeff's presentation or, or even now. Um, and yeah, we. Jeff will be doing video as well as audio, and uh, so I think I think we should have a, a, a good um, uh, you know you should have a uh, we should have a strong webinar today. Um, I would like to just kick us off with doing a baseline poll to get a sense of your um, understanding of the topic. Uh, so I'm going to launch uh, a poll right now. Um, which basically asks, how much do you know about collective intelligence? And there are a few options to, uh, to, uh, to answer. So we're going to launch that poll right now. How much do you know about collective intelligence? Nothing at all. I've worked with people and machines to produce something in sometime in the past. Um, I, or I have expert level knowledge of collective intelligence. So take a moment to give that a think and um, uh, we have, uh, we'll spend a minute on, on that. Um, we have, okay, we have a question, we have a comment from Darren Gleason, who's saying, anyone else having difficulty with audio? I can't hear a thing. Um, Let me just handle that bilaterally, because it seems like I just can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll just handle that one bilaterally. Um, so if you could just take a moment to answer the poll, we have about 51% uh, saying uh, no knowledge of the topic, 45% um, saying I have worked with people and machines to produce something, and 2% uh, are saying that they have expert knowledge of collective intelligence. Um, so let me just, we'll take a second more. I think we have basically 81% of all of you have voted. 
Uh, that's a pretty good number. Now we have 83. Take a, two more seconds to think about your answer submitted, and then we will close the poll. Um, so we'll close the poll now. Okay. Um, now let me just share the results so everyone sees what we have. Um, so 55% so have registered uh, no knowledge and 43% have some knowledge. And I think that's, that covers the broad sweep of, of, uh, of people's familiarity with the topic. Um, let me just hand then to uh, Jeff, who will kick off his uh, presentation. And uh, we'll get back to you, Darren. Uh, if you could just get let us know bilaterally whether you can hear us now, and I'll try to also contact you during the course of the uh, during the course of the presentation. So, without further ado, Jeff, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Peter and Gina. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I'm a great admirer of what many of the, the teams around the UN have been doing in this space, and I've learned a great deal from you and have quite high hopes of what's going to be achieved in the next few years in the space I'm going to talk about. What I'll cover this afternoon is, is quite a broad topic and in a way is a mix of some specific uh, tools and ideas which might be relevant to your work. But I'll also be arguing that some of the greatest value from these comes from linking them up, from connectivity. Uh, and uh, the combination of different tools is what perhaps really contributes to intelligence. That is harder, but many of you are uniquely well placed to do some of that uh, connecting work. So a very quick bit of background, and hopefully you can see some slides. So some of the background for me in this area was a lot of work, as Gina said, on on public strategy, running a strategy team in the UK, working in both developed countries like Australia and Singapore, but also quite a bit in, in China uh, and the Gulf and Latin America, mainly trying to help governments do the various things you'll see there, which is what that book was about, how to design strategies, not on paper, but so they really were lived by whole systems, how to handle both positive and negative risk innovation, new ideas, um, how to do evidence, experiments, trust, uh, new tools like behavioral economics. And, and a big emphasis of my work was on the endless challenge of how do you get complex systems to coordinate horizontally, something which uh, uh, many of you are right immersed in uh, at the moment. And no one really gets it right, but it's uh, a matter of degrees of getting it wrong and there are plenty of tools now around which weren't even around 10 years ago and I guess that that whole sort of body of work has led me to this focus on collective intelligence which in some ways is a new frame for thinking about often quite traditional or long-standing questions about how you plan how you organize how you get large numbers of people to 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 think and act effectively on the sort of problems you're you're all dealing with. In a way, it's a question of really how do you get uh, a whole region or country or a health system or a farming system to be more like a, a, a brain, able to, to think and act in the way that hopefully, even at 9.30 in the morning, your brains are able to do quite a lot of things at once. And all of this, in many ways, is very influenced by the flood we're all seeing of, of new, new technologies, new tools, Artificial intelligence is being talked about everywhere. China aims to have a $150 billion AI industry by the end of the next decade. Thousands of people working on uh, machine learning, not just in Facebook or driverless cars or homes, but also increasingly on, on issues like public health and, um, and agriculture. My concern has been that, in a way, this is creating quite a distorted framework where Often the AI is being thought about without attention to the human element, without attention to social conditions. And one of our risks in the next five or 10 years is we have a lot of very smart machines around us, but the, the, the real systems we count on, particularly governance systems, may look, if anything, stupider than they were 10 or 20 years ago. And there's obviously no examples in my mind when I, when I say that. Um, but I think that's a fear that much of the public shares. So that's why I've gone back in a way to this parallel tradition of thinking about 
collective intelligence. This is a picture from a, a famous example in the 19th century when a scientist called Francis Galton went to a country fair where people were guessing the weight of a cow. And he discovered that the, the collective guess was incredibly accurate and the individual guesses were incredibly inaccurate. And that led to this whole stream of thinking about the wisdom of crowds. When is it that getting a, a, a large group to make an assessment of it could be the future of the economy or an election, you might get more insight than even the best individual expert. And since then, there's been a lot of experimentation in this space from um, uh, people like NASA who've run experiments where they hide balloons across the US and uh, let teams compete to find them using um, so imaginative ways of mobilizing crowds to examples in healthcare like this woman Dana Lewis who who mobilized a crowd to design an artificial pancreas and then to help manage the data coming out from an artificial pancreas a sort of crowd uh, science example there are many others now in everything from astronomy to um, bird watching uh, to archaeology where literally millions of people uh, analyze online images to spot patterns in ways which are more efficient than the experts alone can do or indeed the machines alone can do. So this is a very fertile field of experiment and there are also examples like um, uh, 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 Duolingo which many of you may use for learning languages which is a combination of a online language training service but it also mobilizes thousands of volunteers to generate new language, like maybe you know, Spanish and Mongolian, say, uh, and, and then gives them a, a small reward for doing so. So it's a combination of a business, an online business, and a crowd intelligence, collective intelligence model for much more effective and cheap uh, language training. So from looking at many of these examples, um, I've tried to develop a framework for thinking about how collective intelligence could and should be organized and how an organization might think about itself and what it was doing well or badly. And in many ways, the analogy here is with how all of us think uh, every day of, uh, or hopefully uh, every day of the year in our own uh, brains and bodies, where our intelligence consists of a number of, in some ways quite discrete uh, separate functions. There's the ability to, to observe, to see, hear, uh, uh, smell and so on. There's the fact that we're always creating and then adapting our models of the world. And in our case, it could be a model where we assume if we take action X, perhaps in our work, result Y will follow. And of course, if you're running a government or a public policy, you always have an implicit model of how childcare provision or regulation of water will have, have effects. There's then analysis and prediction. Again, everything we do in our daily lives requires us to make sense of patterns and, uh, and have some predictions of what will uh, happen in the future. We have our memory, so we hopefully don't repeat mistakes too often. We have intelligent empathy, the ability to think into the minds of others, and probably that the greatest ever film, I think, about governance which is the interview with Robert McNamara, who once ran the World Bank, was where he said the biggest errors of governments are always failures, not of analysis, but failures of empathy, being able to see how things look to people on the receiving end. There's motor coordination. How do you hold your, your body together? And again, governments have motor coordination challenges of food distribution or policing and so on. There's creativity to come up with new solutions when the old ones don't work. And then there's judgment and wisdom. And we all do all of these things all the time with different bits of our brain. Our brains work by being highly connected, the 83 billion neurons firing uh, across each other, which enables us to combine data, memory, creativity, and uh, some of the time, wisdom. Um, Technology is transforming many of these, but in a very uneven way. So with dramatic enhancements in data collection and in some fields, predictive analytics and in some fields, memory, but not much effect yet on creativity or judgment or wisdom. And so what I'm gonna briefly do is say a little bit about some of these, uh, these elements where 
collective intelligence tools are already becoming, I think, part of the toolkit for the sort of work UN agencies do. And then I'm going to talk about where that might go next and how those might be brought together to be something a bit more like a, a, a true functioning brain. So here's just a, a few examples. So this is the sort of one which is probably pretty familiar to you, where we've seen in the last few years an explosion of new ways of gathering data, not just within Facebook, uh, but sensors gathering data from um, uh, street lights, satellite sensors like the Dove satellites, tracking economic activity or environmental activity. Uh, this example from Jakarta, uh, which UN colleagues are involved in, is citizen generation of flood data to help a city track the state of floods. And there are literally thousands of examples of these which are mobilizing a collective brain to see uh, the world in real time in a, in a more accurate way, mobilizing citizens as well as machine intelligence. Far further for that to go, I think, as a field, uh, but this is already becoming part of, um, in some ways, part of everyday practice. The same to a degree is true of, of predictive modeling, um, though more controversially. So AI in different forms is being used for things like crime prediction in US cities, for uh, in criminal justice, deciding who should get probation. Uh, it's used in health systems to predict who's most likely to come back into hospitals. All sorts of challenges of ethics and bias in those, but they are going to be used more. And I've just put there an example from a couple of months ago of a, of a really good piece of work looking at using AI to improve refugee integration by helping agencies better predict what kind of jobs different refugees would get in different parts of Europe. And we're seeing a lot of I think creative experiment with predictive algorithms around development issues where five years ago they were mainly being used by the military uh, or by um, companies like YouTube for recommendation engines, so not for a huge amount of public benefit. There's then creativity. Um, this is challenges.org, which is one of the, the Nesta sites, which is one of quite a few now, which try to mobilize really a global brain to solve problems, uh, problems ranging from isolation of the elderly to mobility problems to uh, aquaculture problems. Uh, this is an example from last year we did for USAID on data-driven farming, helping farmers in the Indian subcontinent, uh, but mobilizing a community of innovators from all over the world to help them. Uh, just a week or two ago, we, we launched the Fall Army Worm Prize. This is a, a, a huge threat to farming in Africa. And here again, we're trying to tap into creative solutions from all over the world um, to, uh, who have to demonstrate that their ideas really work in dealing with this very acute problem. And if you know anyone who could be a, a bidder for this, please get them to get in touch. The deadline for entries is, is mid-May. But again, this is a set of tools to mobilize collective intelligence to solve problems, not just the people inside the UN or a national government or a private company. And there's then a whole series of new tools for organizing memory. In theory, the memory of, of, a, of a government or a governance system should be pretty well organized. But in, in all of my experience, um, it's really badly organized and no one really knows what's known. A government can do something and 10 years later do the same thing and have completely forgotten what was learned or what what, what was or, or what what happened well and what happened badly. There's now been a, a flood of attempts to systematize the memory of different fields. Here in the UK, we have 10 what works centers, which try to do that for fields like uh, aging or or children. Uh, this is an example from Latin America, which I'm involved in, which is drawing on these to try and systematize um, evidence on what works in schooling uh, across Latin America and the Caribbean. And the key is making it really easy to digest so that busy teachers can actually use it and see for different kind of interventions, how well they work, how much they cost, uh, and to be able to click on each of these bits to dig down to much uh, more detailed research, which is the collective memory. And a key message here is that if you don't really actively curate the memory, it isn't used. And if you don't make the memory really usable, it isn't used. 
it's no good having vast repositories of evidence if they're organized in a way which doesn't make sense for the busy people on the ground. And unfortunately, most of the attempts in the last 20 years of this kind of repositories of evidence have had almost no impact at all because they haven't been used or, or very usable. So those are just a few of the sort of functional ways where new collective intelligence tools are becoming relevant. Um, in, in my book, I argue that it's key then to also have learning loops, ways that you make sense of um, what comes in from them. And I talk about there being a first loop learning, which is what we do most of the time, adapting our thought and action within an existing framework. And this is the everyday business of pretty much all policy making and implementation in a public system. You get some new data in on what is or isn't working, perhaps in a classroom teaching program or a maternal uh, health program, and you adjust, you, you recalibrate according to the, 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 the feedback. And we're good at that much of the time, and nearly all the AI programs are essentially first loop learning, but often done very, very powerfully. But to be actually an intelligent organization, you also need to often develop new categories to think with. And we think of organizations as stupid if they just get trapped in a first loop and optimize within one framework and can't see when it's hitting barriers, when doing the same thing again and again isn't working. And so humans are quite good at inventing new categories, new models uh, to think with. And one of the things which is fascinating about some of the new uh, sort of citizen uh, input tools, like this one from, um, from Tanzania, is that they often generate new insights into things which hadn't really occurred to a government um, about what matters, what's important, what's going, uh, going wrong. So for example, experiences of poverty are often very different from the ways in which governments measure poverty. Issues of isolation were hardly talked about in policy circles. There was no real category for them, but increasingly becoming uh, important in many parts of the world. So this is a, a, a crucial part of collective intelligence, almost entirely missing from much of the data and AI debate. And then third loop learning is when you realize you have to actually rethink how your whole system thinks uh, in, in real time. And one of the best examples of that in recent years uh, in the UN system is the IPCC and climate change, where the world has essentially invented a new way of organizing its brain around climate change. Huge numbers of scientists organized in working groups, developing scenarios, feeding that back into policy making, feeding that in turn into big events like COP21 uh, and Paris to help the decision makers make decisions informed by something closer to the world's collective intelligence rather than just a few reports from a handful of experts or just one model. And I think one of the really intriguing questions of the next few years is what other fields could learn from both the successes and failures of IPCC and orchestrate the global brain, perhaps around things like, um, uh, like epidemics or natural disasters, but in as systematic a way uh, as they've done. And perhaps adding into the the sort of slow and steady approach of the IPCC, rapid response research projects, which quickly orchestrate the best social scientists, natural scientists from around the world to analyze new, new problems and, uh, and make that knowledge usable for decision makers. That's largely missing from the, uh, the, the world's universities, the huge brain power we have scattered around the world. So what I want to just, just end on is, is where I think this maybe takes us. And in the book, I argue that some of the greatest value of collective intelligence, just as individual intelligence, comes from when we connect together things like observation and data, models and predictions, analysis and interpretation, memory, creativity, into a single system which informs action and then learning from that action. That, I think, is what we should be aspiring to in pretty much every field we work in. It's what I, in a small way, try to do with strategy in government, but often lacking the best tools to make that possible. And my, my sort of challenge to each of you, really, is, is, is what's possible in the field you work in, which might be a bit more like this kind of assembly. And I'll give you now a, a briefly a few examples, which I think give some suggestions how this could be done. 
So the first one is Google Maps, which many of us use every day. Uh, that's where I am at the moment in the middle of that map. Google Maps is often thought of to have been an, an invention of Google, and in some ways it was. Google decided to organize the world's geographical knowledge in one place, but they in fact lacked most of the skills for doing it. So they, they bought a whole series of companies and people who provided different elements like the scrollable screens and street map and Google Earth. They opened up with the API so that programmers could integrate Google Maps into thousands, if not millions, of websites around the world, making it more useful. They opened up to the public through Google Map Maker at the bottom there, so people could fill in missing bits of the map. So this was, in many ways, a collective intelligence assembly. It was driven by business models, you know, the desire to obviously get more traffic and more data for Google, but it created, in some ways, an extraordinarily valuable public service because it was an assembly which brought together all these different elements in a really useful form. And I think it's quite a good so prompt to think what the equivalence of that might be in the other areas uh, that, are, that matter to development. Here's a few examples of which I think are, are pointers rather than being quite mature. In the environmental field, a few years ago, NASA and Cisco tried creating a planetary skin institute to be a sort of global brain for, um, for the environment, gathering together data on on seas and farming and forestry, et cetera, linking to universities, uh, to supercomputers making forecasts. They couldn't quite get the, the business model right. They couldn't quite link it to practice, but it was a, a, an important um, sort of test. And in Europe, Copernicus is a huge and very well-funded public effort at a comprehensive uh, sort of nervous system, again, for Europe's environment, Though, as with Planetary Skin Institute, not really feeding into the practice and the practical knowledge of people on the ground. So these are halfway to being a collective intelligence assembly, but not the whole way. In health, there's a, there's a number of really promising initiatives around at the moment, like uh, this one in epi epidemics called AMI, which tries to link uh, often citizen-generated data about epidemics or risk of epidemics in Things, things like dengue fever and Ebola, uh, AI predictive algorithms to show how those might spread through in a population, and Brazil and Malaysia have been in the forefront, uh, and then linking into public uh, health workers on the ground to help them respond much more quickly to outbreaks. And I think this is a, it's a small startup, this, but it's beginning to show what a collective intelligence assembly can do on on really it's sort of uh, immediate crises, uh, and it's at a global scale. Uh, another example is Metasub, which is uh, trying to map um, bacteria and really to help protect the world from the risk of anti uh, of um, antibiotics stopping a huge risk for the world. And one of the ways they're doing that is tracking the state of bacteria in subways across the world. This is the patho map of the New York uh, subway showing the presence of different um, bacteria in different places. Quite a few of them are plagues. There's a lot of plague around on many subway systems. And the aim is, and they now link about, I think, 80 cities around the world, that again, the world as a whole can have a, a real-time view of the state of bacteria, the genomes of bacteria, so that the globe can respond much more effect effectively and quickly to uh, threats of resistant bacteria uh, for things like TB uh, and, and avert the risk of maybe 40, 50 million people a year dying by mid-century, which is what some forecasters are, are, are warning of. A very different example is, is this is one from closer to home here in, in the UK, is the Cancer Registration Service, which has gone a, a very long way within a public sector of just gathering together huge numbers of data sets of every patient with cancer, bringing together all the uh, the analysis, the scans, the patient records, linking it to genomics data, linking it to predictive algorithms, which can show the patient and the doctor how different treatment courses will help them survive, uh, and beginning to link also to socioeconomic data so they can see which families are most at risk of debt 
because of the cancer, hopefully then to put in place remedial support. Again, it's not the whole way there, but it's a pointer to a, again, a much more of a collective intelligence assembly, which can really help 300,000 people a year who get cancer uh, manage, navigate uh, cancer, not just as a, as, a, as a disease, but also in terms of its social and economic effects uh, as well. And then a very different example comes from governance and democracy. There have been a, a lot of experiments in recent years using online tools to involve um, the public in generating ideas, in taking part in decision making. Uh, cities in Spain have really picked up on what Brazil pioneered back in the 90s in Curitiba with participatory budgeting. And there are now many examples of these, these online platforms at city level in particular, where the public can propose ideas, comment, deliberate, and vote. Um, Taiwan has arguably gone the furthest in this with V Taiwan, which is run by the government and the parliament. And is an attempt at, again, an assembly of elements to help governance and decision-making work better. In this case, breaking down a series of stages from the, the top there, the O, down to, dis, to D, so that on a topic, first of all, there's an open process of gathering the facts. Uh, ministries can say what they think the facts are. NGOs can say what they think the facts are. Researchers can. And that's all done as a, as a discrete process published on a Wikipedia timeline. There's then a series of steps for reflection, interpretation, and argument to look through different options, both online, helped by AI tools like Polis, but also uh, offline through face-to-face -face meetings. And then the parliament and government makes a decision in some ways in a traditional way, but having been informed by a much more open, inclusive, and I think intelligent decision-making uh, process. And I think in terms of the future of governance, which is obviously a, 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 a huge issue for almost every part of the UN, uh, even if not everywhere can jump to a, the kind of sophistication of a Taiwan, and I have to say this is far more sophisticated than the parliament uh, about a mile down the road from where I'm sitting here, some elements of this are feasible in almost uh, any environment. So what I want to end with is a few uh, sort of thoughts about where where might all of this go for the UN? What might your role be in all of this? And I think there's there's three or four possible routes. Some of which uh, say work we've done in the past with with Gina and other colleagues at UNDP I think has has pointed to. So the first is really to think about a specific field of action in a specific place. So let's say you know aquaculture in in India, or um, or, or, or you know, post-conflict reconstruction. How is it possible to think of, a, of an assembly of these different elements of intelligence to help that whole system operate more effectively? Gathering uh, the different kinds of data sources there will be, some public, some commercial, some web scraping, some satellite, some citizen generated, linking it to processes of shared interpretation and analysis, maybe by again, NGOs or businesses or governments, and then with a loop into, into action. So it becomes a commons, a shared resource. And I think that's very feasible. And, and indeed, I think in a few years time, it will be just amazing to anyone, this, this isn't really the core of, of any development or governance activity, is to orchestrate something like this kind of collective intelligence, rather than just relying on a few experts or a consultancy or, 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 or having data projects which are only data projects and not linked into the wider system. I think for governance as a whole, there's a sort of broader task of really shifting the norms and cultures of, of, of decision making, civil servants, ministers, etc. So as a matter of course, for anything, you are harvesting all the resources of intelligence beyond your organization as well as inside. And for anything, there will be lots of wisdom and knowledge and data to be harvested from your own people, from, again, businesses, perhaps from mobile phone companies, perhaps from satellites, how to make your decision-making processes more open, more deliberative, and then also to have monitoring of results, feedback loops, learning, first, second, and third loop. And then I think the biggest challenge perhaps in all of this is then how do you cultivate 
people who are good at this. So you need people with technical skills, um, computer scientists and data scientists and so on, but often as important are the kind of streetwise people who can link that to the realities on the ground, the messy political contexts of conflict and argument and distrust, et cetera, which many of you I'm sure you know, live every day of the week. And we need, and I think often we're missing people with that mix of skills who are as confident with the next generation of digital tools as they are confident going into a, or, or, you know, a, a complex, conflicted situation and reading the patterns, knowing you know what's possible, what isn't possible, et cetera, et cetera, which is a highly, highly political skill set. And all of this, I think, to me, really boils down to what, what I call intelligence design. We've got billions and billions of commercial money and public money going into AI. Uh, all over the world, from China and India to Canada, US, UK, France. But if it isn't linked into human intelligence and collective intelligence, as I said at the beginning, we risk a, a slightly unhappy future of smartphones and dumb systems all around us. And so I, I'm trying to sort of work on how do we create people who are good at intelligence design, how you design the underpinning systems of intelligence, which then help decision making, action, development in all its forms uh, happen. And I really hope the, the UN in all its forms is right at the forefront of this because you've both got more to contribute, but I think potentially more to gain from this than probably any, any, any other set of institutions. So I think I'll, I'll stop there and hopefully that's at least sparked a few specific thoughts, um, but also maybe some things you want to challenge me back on. Many thanks. A huge, Jeff, a huge thanks, Jeff. This is this is so exciting. We have some colleagues in the room here, and about eighty-two colleagues now online in in various countries and different parts of the UN. Um, and we're all we're all just glad we're taping this so we can go back and rewind and and catch it again because there's so many great examples in here that we want to catch. I just want to iterate uh, three points that you've made before we we will do two more polls and then we'll open up for question and answers. First, I think one thing I've noticed about what you're talking, uh, the examples you gave are collective intelligence works best when there's a highly specific problem, right? I had never heard of the worm you're talking about in Africa, right? So obviously it took a lot of research to get to that point. Maybe it's just my ignorance, but maybe it's also research. Also the kind of very specific kinds of disease that are resistant to um, antibiotics, et cetera, the sort of Honing in the problem seems like a core thing to be able to channel and orchestrate collective intelligence for public good. Secondly, just to reiterate the point you've now made at the end, that this is about humans and machines working together. So it's collective intelligence and artificial intelligence. And whether it's Google Map Maker, where people fill in the details, um, or the Amy projects where it's reaching out to health workers to also bring in their own knowledge. I would just call attention to um, the UN uh, refugee agencies work um, on something called Project Jetson, which is where they have machine learning and former and current residents of Mogadishu uh, predicting migration patterns. So this is, again, it's, it's really that, that combination that really makes the magic happen. Um, and then finally, just a word on your the the three learning loops you mentioned. Um, you know, being able to adjust based on the feedback we get from the collective, um, being able to set in place new categories and models, and finally at the at the third loop, um, bringing up new ways of thinking. Um, I just want to say I think this is particularly relevant for the public sector, and certainly my own experience in the UN. Um, in my experience, what happens is um, so just to take one one story, in the run up to the sustainable development goals, right, which are sort of our marching orders until 2030. This is this is our job is to try to come close to making those happen with with governments and people and businesses around the world. Um, in the run up to that, we did channel 10 million people to weigh in on what they need for their future. Now, when things go through intergovernmental processes and they land in 17 sustainable development goals iterated in 169 targets and measured by 226 indicators. 
many of which there is no data for or even way of measuring, um, we get a little lost in our own, that becomes our classification system, right? And therefore it's hard for us to see beyond that because it's really hard to do that in the first place. And therefore we get a little like focused on that. So the idea of constantly iterating and having kind of emergent classification like the tags, you know, the hashtags on Twitter um, is something I think we need, we need to learn how to do better. So, so I just wanted to call attention to those three, three points that I thought might uh, kick off our Q&A session. Um, before we open it up for questions, we're going to um, administer two polls, which we think will help us channel the conversation. Um, so, so let me hand over to Peter for, for two more quick polls, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Okay, so I've just launched the next poll. Uh, you can see it on your screen. Uh, what are some of the challenges you faced in applying this approach? Um, uh, if you have uh, been involved in 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 applying it, um, the uh, and you see a number of options. You can pick as many as are relevant to you. Uh, take a moment to um, to respond to this poll, and then we will. Uh, so take a. Few few moments to. We have about twenty five people have voted so far. Um, and so far, it looks like about fifty percent of you are citing lack of participatory government governance forums um, as a, as a key challenge. Uh, Sixty nine percent of you have cited low receptivity of the public sector to collective intelligence. Uh, take a, another second and then a couple of seconds uh, if you'd like to jump in please do now um, and then we will uh, we'll close the poll okay so I think we'll we'll close it now um, and those are the results that that you see uh, in front of uh, on your screen um, <clears throat> So it seems like most of you have cited uh, two things, one of lack of participatory governance forums and low receptivity of, public sec of the public sector to collective intelligence. Um, so now we'll move on to the third and final poll. Um, and that is what uh, functions of intelligence uh, I'll launch the poll and then, and then you'll see the full question. What functions of intelligence do you think people and machines can do better together? Uh, this refers back to some of the concepts that uh, Jeff mentioned. So in terms of intelligence, um, they are, you know, observe, analyze, remember, create, empathize and judge. So which of these do you think people and machines can do better together? Uh, take a moment to vote um, so we can uh, see what, what, uh, what the collective intelligence of all of you online uh, has to, uh, to say to this. And also, if you have any questions, please do put them in the question box uh, because we'd like to spend the next uh, 15 minutes or so in discussing what you have to, uh, uh, what, what, what the issues that you would like to raise. So I think I will close this poll now. Um, we have about 53% of you have voted. So take a second to, um, to respond. Um, yeah, so I'll close this poll now and share the results with you. Um, so it seems like we have, uh, you know, pretty high percentages across all of the categories with the exception of uh, empathy and judgment. Uh, so I think that, that, that already provides some feedback uh, for, for us here um, at DOCO as well as for Jeff and, and, and all of our collective understanding of, um, of, uh, of, of, of the topic. Um, so on that note, we have a number of questions. Gina, do you think we should launch into the questions now, or would you like to say a couple of words? No, just to do? say maybe we can use the results of these polls to kind of guide uh, some of the responses, Jeff. I mean, it seems uh, 
colleagues would like to hear more about, uh, in a way, how to increase receptivity to a collective intelligence approach, particularly in the public sector, um, where participatory forums may be lacking. Um, and and just uh, maybe just to reiterate now, based on our hunches of, of which functions of the brain can be better done together um, to to reiterate, you know, some of the examples of these and, and whether these are match with your experience as well. But go ahead, Peter, why don't you start taking questions? Just if we can understand what, what country and organization you're working from. We understand most of the colleagues online are working in UN agencies um, around the world. Uh, I think our colleagues in Pakistan may have invited some government partners to be part of the discussion and other partners in, in other countries. So very much looking forward to hear from you and, um, and to hear back from Jeff on your, your questions. Okay, great. So I'll just launch in with the first uh, question. The question comes from Chris Supengat, and maybe you can just add in uh, uh, where you work, uh, your country and organization. And the question from Chris is, do you factor in cultural perspectives and norms in building a platform for harnessing collective intelligence? Um, Jeff, do you want to take a, take a shot at that one? Yeah, I think in, in practice, you have to do that in several meanings of cultural factors. There's the culture of a, of a, of a nation or a region, but also of the particular um, profession. If you're working with farmers, you know, you need to present information, data in a completely different way than if you're dealing with, with doctors. Uh, and that's why co-creation of these uh, tools is key. The example I showed from Latin America on education and the SUMA project, those sort of things only work if teachers are closely involved in the design of the platform. Otherwise, they become these sort of orphan systems which, which aren't embedded. So I, I would take that um, for granted in a way that's that's the challenge back to to all of you is how do you make things sort of fit, make sense, be meaningful in a in a in a particular context. Ones which too standardized and too universal probably won't work. And the other point perhaps to make in response to both the poll and Gina is I think in in practice it is much easier to do this around a specific problem. It's harder to tell a minister, let's create a collective intelligence system for X. But if you're pragmatically focused on maybe getting more kids into school or more. Into jobs or increasing vaccination rates or build your collective intelligence tools around problem solving, ideally with you know timetables and targets to really quicken the energy. That's a much better way of getting people attuned culturally to these sort of things than trying to get them to buy into the theory. I'd hope that people like you can buy into the theory, but in, t in terms of the practicality on the ground with officials who may feel a bit threatened by this, much better to get them to use it in a, in a modest way, solving something, and then feeling the, 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 the pride and the authority which comes from success bef before you then spread out perhaps to, uh, to broader topics. So not whole SDGs, but very um, granular parts of SDGs is probably the best way to go. Exactly, Jeff. I remember when, when we were in Lesotho, you, you challenged the UN team there to come up with a 100 days approach. So really just to kind of kick things off. I'm not sure if today we have uh, colleagues from Lesotho online. If we do, um, it'd be great to hear from you, um, especially because I think we have some questions around um, whether or not there are any current initiatives of collective intelligence to address the sustainable development goals. So, so certainly um, the colleagues who have worked with this before, um, it may be more than Lesotho, but we know about Lesotho. Um, please, do, please do let us know if you're out there and, and speak up. Great, and, and that question, just to let you know, came from Chris of the UN Capital Development Fund in New York. And moving on to the next uh, question from uh, Pulse Lab in Jakarta. Um, feel free to add in your, your, your name. The question is, in developing countries, uh, especially in remote areas where internet availability is limited, is there any way to work around this issue? Any use cases of collective intelligence as examples? Um, Jeff, do you want to take a stab at that one? 
Well, on uh, we we've, we've been involved in. Um, there's been offline and offline combined. And certainly in terms of participatory democracy or participatory governance, I would always urge not to depend only on online tools. That's partly because of, of access, and that may be access in remote rural areas, or it might be parts of demographics who aren't very connected. But it's also that you get a different kind of conversation still face to face than ever online, perhaps as we, we realize in, in, in this webinar. So, um, the, the, the good examples, I showed Taiwan, the same is true in Spain and India as well, are where any online process always has some complementary offline process, which might be um, uh, you know, sending people for village level consultations and then capturing some of that in a digital uh, form rather than only depending on, on the digital. So I hope I haven't made it sound as if um, we're, we're still not yet at a world where uh, things can be done 100% online, and people will feel feel included. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure you you see that every day. Great, thank you. Uh, the next uh, question comes from Thomas Ritzer of DPA in New York, and Thomas asks: In the age of bots and fake news, how can you ensure collective intelligence reflects the real concerns and opinions of People. Maybe just maybe just uh, our acronyms sometimes are not known to everyone. Uh, the Department of Political Affairs is part of the United Nations here in New York. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, um, Jeff. The can I yeah. hand that one to you? Well, this, this is this is obviously a huge issue, and I, I can only touch on. Uh, and on the one hand, there is I think an arms race already underway. between uh, fake news, particularly uh, create fake videos, and uh, and a lot of the tech community trying to come up with counter measures to either spot those or counter those. And um, this is only going to heat up in the next few years. The reason I like some of the examples like V-Taiwan is it makes it explicit that part of the governance process is organizing a space for, for facts and for truth. Um, rather than relying on the media or social media to do that. We cannot nowadays rely on uh, the media for all sorts of reasons. So it has to be consciously curated by governments and, and parliaments. And I think there are now quite a few good examples which are, which are doing that in competition with the counter pressures to, um, to fake news. I, I also would predict, I mean, one of the effects of the Facebook um, rows of uh, of, of the last few weeks and months is I think in many countries we are going to be moving towards digital bills of rights and one part of those will be having to protect democratic systems from from attack with a whole new battery of uh, of, of tools and laws but that's probably a topic for another day uh, in 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 my book I have a whole chapter on fighting the enemies of collective intelligence because the Every intelligence is a zone of conflict, manipulation, disinformation, uh, trolling, and so on. And we have to greatly strengthen the immune systems to protect against these forces. And one of the mistakes of a lot of the literature on the wisdom of crowds a few years ago is it, I think it assumed a much more benign climate for thought and action than perhaps we, we see in 2018. Absolutely. And certainly not to say that just because groups of people are using collective intelligence that their goals are um, worthy. Mm. Um, a lot of that has been studied and, and, and happening recently where, where highly sophisticated methods um, where one might judge the intent of, of, of what they're trying to do together collectively. So Peter, do Great. we want to bring some more questions in? Sure. We have a question from Akiko Ito. Um, uh, please, uh, Aki, uh, Akiko, if you could just let us know um, where you are and what your Odessa, I see, from uh, from the, the Department, Department of, of Economic, Economic and, and Social <laughs> Affairs <laughs> um, uh, in headquarters. And Akiko asks, how do we address cross-cutting issues, including disability and gender, in the SDGs, and in co-creating artificial intelligence, collective intelligence universe to support policy making, analysis, and monitoring and evaluation. 
Well, I think disability is actually a, 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 an ideal topic for some of these things. Um, disability obviously is a huge global problem. If you add together all the different disabilities, maybe well be a billion people. Um, and there's a, a, a really striking absence of global institutions devoted to uh, both the learning about disability and action and policy and strategy. Uh, and yet this is a field where almost all the things I've described can be, be used. So for a start, there is actually monitoring both the facts of different disabilities and experiences of disability at a national or a global level. The sort of tools I described are very well suited for doing that and also giving disabled people, therefore, a voice um, in a way which simply hasn't been the case in the past. Uh, we at Nesta are now running uh, several prizes, global prizes around disability. One aimed at the for the Tokyo Olympics in 2020 on essentially alternatives to to, to wheelchairs. We've done it in the past, trying to mobilise um, technologists, um, makers of all kinds to use their skill and energy to come up with. Um, practical new tools for people with disabilities. Uh, in India, the National Innovation Foundation has run quite a few programs of that kind, again, mobilizing grassroots innovation around uh, disability. And this is also a, a community which is probably, in some ways, some of, might find it easier to use online tools to take part in the kind of democratic deliberation that a V Taiwan is doing, because obviously many people are are housebound. So I actually see disability as, and the SDG around disability as a fantastic opportunity for the UN system to sort of really raise the, the, the visibility of a whole clutch of issues which affect a huge proportion of the world's population directly and everyone indirectly and at the moment is, is rather lacking in orchestration, curation and, and voice. Great. Thank, thank you, Jeff. That was really a, a, a very comprehensive answer. Um, we have a, uh, a comment from Mirko in Lesotho. If you'd like, I can give a quick input on our SDG challenge prize we launched jointly with the National University. Um, and Mirko, I'm happy to unmute you and then you can speak to that. Um, let me just do that right Maybe now. Maybe just to say, Mirko, I think arrived as you unmute Mirko. Yeah. Um, Mirko uh, arrived in Lesotho, I think, like two days or something before um, the the team from Nesta uh, came, um, and I think he's just been he's just been uh, running ever since. So so <laughs> really really excited to hear about what has happened uh, since since we all landed in Lucero and and had lots of meetings with government and partners and Vodacom etc. So so do tell us how things are going, Mirko. We've got oh, you, yeah. oh, I think I just froze, he says. Uh, we've got you unmuted. Um, if you wanna just type, uh, you can, if, you, if, you, if you're having some sound problems. Um, otherwise, if you unmute yourself, maybe we can hear yes. you. Yes, I'm, you know, can, oh. I, can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes, 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 all right. Thank you very much. Um, and also, Gina, for the quick introduction, I, I missed what you've been saying, but I um, guess you gave a good background on, um, <clears throat> Our, our developments and um, I, the first thing I heard, I arrived the week the Nesta mission was hosted in Lesotho. So we were very fortunate to hear about collective intelligence and innovation on a more broader scale um, to be um, implemented in Lesotho or to be upscaled in Lesotho. So on the, on the SCD challenge price, we, we took a slightly different approach than to what uh, Jeff just um, presented to us. So we after having the, uh, identified the, the, the issues that could be addressed um, in Lesotho, uh, one of the, the proposals was to, to host a, a challenge prize and basically channeling collective intelligence for our collective problem solving in the country. And instead of um, defining specific tasks, we said we only defined areas and then worked with students from the university to, to develop the task for us. So in our case, we said we have three areas we would like to get engaged in, uh, which was one broader SDG area, one specifically on um, unemployment and the disconnect of education, and the second one on health and HIV and AIDS related issues. 
So we had a two-day workshop with students where they defined after being introduced to the concept, the tasks that we then initially um, issued through a wider competition um, in the country. Um, the, whole, the, 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 the whole project was a big success because um, not only we defined the, the, the problems, no, not, we, don't, we didn't define the problems, but let the public define the problems that they see and, or they face in their daily life and then ask them to ultimately give us the solutions for it. So in the end, we awarded on a small scale 10 innovative um, solutions to the pressing challenges um, we identified. And um, all young students, entrepreneurs, some of the teams were um, intergenerational even, some youth, some, some older generations. So it was quite a nice mixture to really grasp the idea of having the public define um, what they think the solutions might be to their specific problem, um, which also goes along with the idea that if you talk about collective intelligence, you're not only channeling um, the collective, the masses into, into, into a specific problem solving approach, but you basically talk to the people that facing the problems, which mostly uh, or most of the time already have the solutions at hand. And I think this uptake of, you know, more localized um, solutions into our work was um, I think the best outcome of this whole process. And currently the young entrepreneurs and the awarded groups are still implementing their projects, which um, will be evaluated at the end of this year. But um, so far, I think this is a quite a nice example of how, how you can easily set up with collaborations and partnerships such a um, challenge prize. Thank you so much, Mirko. It's, it's always great to, to hear the update coming from Lesotho. Um, and of course, um, as always, um, I know that the team in the studio, Mirko, has, has been one of the silo fighters uh, blogging on, on the UN Development Group blog. Um, so do have a look at that. Um, of course, you're always welcome to submit a continuing story of your work there. Um, we're always we're always welcoming that. So let's just give the floor back to Jeff um, for a couple of closing comments before we wrap up. Well, thanks very much. I'll be very... Brief. I mean, the first one is one of the many reasons it's good. But I think that, as I said earlier, the resource of students, there's 150 million students around the world now uh, who just simply aren't being mobilized enough to help on SDG uh, solutions. And I think there's a, there's a big opportunity to, in a more systematic way, get students all over the world working on local challenges, local problems as a matter of course. Ideally, not just on the, the side of their their, their studies, but, but more integrated to their studies. And there's some good examples of that beginning to happen, but not at great scale. So the Lesotho example is fantastic there. Uh, secondly, it's, it's also really good to hear you know, smart people evolving these ideas in different directions. I'm very much not offering a blueprint here. This is a, a field where lots of people are experimenting and innovating and, and learning fast. And my hope is, that in the next five or 10 years, the field constantly surprises me and I'm hearing about things which I couldn't have imagined, which are, are, are just much better and much more creative and much more practical. My, my final comment though is, a, is really partly about language and positioning. I think collective intelligence is the right description of what we're talking about here. It makes sense to, uh, I hope, to the sort of people on this webinar, but in terms of getting the engagement of, of decision makers on the ground um, is probably not a, a language to use very much. Uh, I think it's much more sensible to focus in on, on the practicalities of problem solving, speeding things up, tapping new resources, including free resources, and gaining confidence through doing it and showing it in practice rather than through the theory. So although I hope all of you might read my book and uh, as we engage with the theory, as with many things, there's then a translation job to be done for it to make sense to people uh, who, who are <laughs> reading the books, et cetera. And, and for those, I think it's, it's, it's linking it to SDGs and linking it ideally to things which can deliver pretty quick results um, on, um, on healthcare, on education, on things like uh, disability or uh, the fail army worm, which I have to confess, Gina, I hadn't heard of three months <laughs> ago either. Um, th this is the way to go and how we build up really strengthen the muscles of the system to do this stuff well. 
Thank you so much, Jeff. And just, just to say, I mean, one of the things I, I always appreciate about the work at, at Nesta, um, which I probably failed to mention, Jeff is the chief executive of Nesta, the National Endowment for Science, Technology and the Arts, which used to be part of the UK government and is now an independent foundation, um, a fantastic organization. Uh, one of the things I most appreciate about Nesta um, is your practicality, your kind of jargon-free zone um, we can always learn things, but in this way that is that is actually easy to um, to put into action and to understand. Um, so always, always very, very grateful um, for for that. I would encourage you all do follow um, the Nesta blog. Um, at the beginning of every year, they set out predictions for the year, um, which I which you know some of which often pan out, um, and it's just interesting to think in that predictive way. Um, and thank you again um, to Jeff Morgan for, for this great conversation. Thank you to all of you online. We do have this recorded. We will send out the recording. Um, and just huge thanks to Peter for Peter Sereni for, for manning the, the webinar here today. Um, have a wonderful evening or rest of your day to all of you. Thanks again, Jeff. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.